Hello. In this video, we're going to continue our solution to what we call now the Buckley Leverett equation. We're going to introduce dimensionless units, the boundary conditions, and then we're going to look a little bit at the fractional flow and uh, think about how we might uh, construct solutions. We'll do this on the whiteboard as usual. Let's let's start with the, the equation that we had, which is written as follows: phi GSW by dt plus QT DFW by dS, and the fractional flow is just a function of saturation, um, and then DSW by dx zero and the fractional flow can be written as this ratio of mobilities okay so that's that's basically how I, I put together the, the solution so let's let's talk about wh where we go next well as a physicist you might think I'm keen on strict SI units, and you're right, but there is one thing that's even better than SI units, and that's dimensionless units. So in fact, the um, Buckley-Leverett, this is called the Buckley-Leverett equation after the people who first proposed it and uh, the solution, but the Buckley-Leverett analysis is normally written in dimensionless units. So let's think about that by considering exactly the system we're interested in. So we have an injection well here. Imagine we inject water here and we produce oil and oil and water here. And we're considering one dimensional flow. So that's the X direction. This will be X equals zero. This is X equals L. And what we're going to do is we're going to impose a total velocity because that's what you inject and that can be a function of time you can you can pump you can inject at different rates okay and we also know that initially before water flooding this represents the water saturation before water flooding we had a reservoir that was at some initial low water saturation and the normal assumption is that this is an immobile water saturation and we normally assume that that's a constant and then we're going to inject water at x equals zero and that seems like you've got a boundary condition you've got qt but you also need to define the saturation so the saturation when i inject water right by the well what's that going to be well the minimum saturation of oil you can get to is the residual oil saturation so the maximum is one minus the residual oil saturation so in fact, strictly speaking, your boundary conditions are that at t equals zero, x greater than zero, you have s w is s w i. And for t greater than zero, so at some time t equals zero, you start injecting. And at the location x equals naught, we have s w is actually one minus s o r. We assume that right by the well, we you know instantly have injected enough water and we've driven the system down to its minimum minimum uh, oil saturation that's the maximum water saturation. but then i said well what about these dimensionless units um, so the dimensionless units are as follows we have a dimensionless distance xd that goes between one and zero and xd is x over l that's sort of pretty obvious okay that's your dimensionless distance but what about dimensionless time now here we introduce a new concept a very powerful concept td is called the poor volumes injected okay. how is that defined well if we have qt is my injection rate and this can be a function of time then the, that's a volume per unit area per unit time. 
So if I multiply it by some cross-sectional area A, there's always got to be some area that's in there. Okay, and I integrate this over time. Okay, this can be between zero and some time T. That will be the total volume of water that I've created. Okay. But TD is defined as the pore volumes, so I need to divide that by the pore volume, which is A is the area, L is the length, so that's the volume of rock that we're considering. And of course, we have a porosity phi. The reason why I'm not dwelling on A is that it always cancels out, so you don't need to fuss about it. Okay, so you have some cross-sectional area, it's a bit of a sort of dummy thing, it always just disappears in the end. So the pore volumes injected, TD, can be defined as, this is what it's defined as, is the integral QT, ET over phi L. Okay, and if QT is constant, then it's just QT times time, but it can be a variable. Okay, so let's um, now put that into the equation and see what we get. So I'm going to get rid of our, my little cartoon here. I don't, hopefully it's sufficiently self-evident that you don't have to sort of have it up all the time to remind you what's going on. Okay, so now we've got um, here, let's do the easy one first. DSW by DX, this is chain rule, is DSW by dx d dx d by dx and that's a partial differential when we assume that the, the time is constant right and dx d by dx is one over l so that term becomes just one over l so that should be easy so here i can put in dsw by dx d and then a one over l okay now what about dsw by dt Okay, so what this is now is the differential of this. So this is TD, is this. If I differentiate it, well, if I differentiate an integral, I just get what's inside. Okay, so um, don't, don't let this confuse you. This is actually pretty basic uh, mathematics. It's just in a, an unusual course. Um, Context. So if you imagine the other way around, if you wanted to find TD, you would integrate QT, right? So that's, that, that you see clearly is correct. So then what we're going to do is if we maybe use a different color. So here we can do DSW by DT D times QT over phi L, right? So that's QT over phi L. And you can see then that the porosities cancel. So that's, that's what happens. Then here, dsw by dx, I'm going to go dsw by dx d, and I divide by l. So when we do this, we see that something nice happens, the porosities cancel, but then both of these terms have qt over l. Okay. So they're going to cancel. And I'm going to end up, therefore, with a much simpler, more elegant form of my equation. So I'm going to get rid of this. This, is, this hopefully is relatively basic mathematics. Just a, just a straightforward change in variables. So then the equation we end up with is something that's very simple. And this fundamentally is the equation that we're going to solve. So it's a dimensionless equation. If I'm going to now reassign the boundary conditions, okay, TD, 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 the next step. Okay, in fact, the boundary conditions in terms of dimensionless time, dimensionless uh, distance are basically the same. So there's no, you know, I don't have to worry, worry about that. Okay, so we've got the equation, we've got it in dimensionless units, which is really nice. So at this point, you can think in any ridiculous unit system you like, but you have a nice dimensionless way of looking at it. Now we want to solve this equation. Now the interesting thing about this equation is an equation that describes how things flow, right? And 
it describes a nonlinear flow because we have this fractional flow here. Right? But it's a first order equation in distance and time. And strangely enough, right, while there are, you know, big, thick, worthy textbooks of applied mathematics with all sorts of equations and all sorts of fancy transforms to solve these equations, you'd be, um, you rarely see equations like this, okay? Um, that is because flow and porous media hasn't been appreciated important subject it is and what's more there are lots of other examples that use this type of conservation equation the other one would be looking at traffic flow for instance traffic flow on a motorway is also a, you have a flux a flow of cars that's a non-linear function of the density of cars the number of cars so in fact there are lots of different examples that have this sort of flow equation so how do you solve um, partial differential equations in fact the reality is you guess the answer and then you check does it obey the equation and the boundary conditions and I know that again, that's not what you're traditionally taught. You're normally taught with this equation, you do this transform, this change of variables, blah, 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 sort of crank, 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 and then you do another case, another case. But the very first people to do it have always been um, inspired by physical insight. You basically guess the solution and then you can see how to do it. So I'm afraid I'm not um, going to do anything uh, very clever because in fact, the solution is, um, really quite straightforward in terms of mathematics, in that this is an equation for how things move, isn't it? I'm going to inject water to displace oil. And let's draw another cartoon. I'm going to do this in blue to show you what's going on. Right? So you imagine here, this is my saturation against distance. You might think to begin with, right, this is one minus SOR. So at early times, I've injected a bit of water and it's near the well, and it doesn't go down to zero because this is your initial water cycle. Okay. So imagine we've got some water here. It's not supposed to have some, this mysterious dip here. That's just my poor drawing, right? Something like that, okay? And then that's supposed to be a constant. So this is the water we've injected, right? So we've injected this water, right? And the oil is flowing over here. Then at some later time, right? we've injected more water and at a later time. So we know this water front is gonna move through the reservoir and that's sort of intuitively obvious, hopefully, right? Don't, 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 get, don't think, oh, I can't see it because where's that coming out and telling me from the equations? It isn't, it's because of you, what you think is happening physically. So we're looking at how things move. And when we want to look at th how things move, it's the speed. It's just the same if we're looking at traffic on a motorway. How fast are the cars going is the key question, it's certainly the key question if you're driving the car. So I'm going to look at a solution in terms of a velocity. I'm going to say, well, I just find the speed with which a particular saturation will move. So VD will be a, uh, a function of uh, saturation and it's defined just as velocity is distance over time. This is dimensionless distance over dimensionless time. And if you are interested, it's very easy to show from the equations. Um, if we have a real velocity here, right? The real velocity is x over t. So if you want to say qt over phi times xd over td, that is your real velocity. Okay, so your real velocity is is qt over phi times your dimensionless velocity. Okay, and that comes just from the, the, the definition here of your dimensionless variables. So I'm going to look for a solution that's just a function of velocity. And don't get too worried about that. It's sort of right because we're looking at things moving, how fast do they move. In the end, we haven't really addressed that concept, but that fundamentally must be what we're talking about. Um, but as I said, it's a guess. Does it obey the partial differential equation? Does it obey the boundary conditions? The answer is yes. It's the solution. If the answer is no, well, we need to look for something else. But obviously, I'm not going to um, present something that I don't know already is going to work. Okay, so just uh, bear with me. So let's give ourselves some space. Um, I think we've defined the boundary conditions now fine, and we will have to just remember what those are and uh, indeed what the um, dimensionless variables are. But of course, I want to keep up the uh, equation that we're actually solving.
So we're going to we're going to write uh, this equation in terms of uh, velocity. Okay, so we got here dsw by dt is going to be dsw by dvd, and if I assume it's just a function of vd, then it's uh, I don't do curly derivatives because there's only one variable. And then this will be dvd by dtd. And it's a, this is when xd is a constant. Okay, and then we can, xd is constant, it doesn't vary. And then we can do the same here. This is again, just a change in variables. And it's a relatively straightforward one. So don't, don't again, overthink it. This will be td. So let's just work this out dv dt is minus x over td squared, so it's minus v v over td. And again, I'm doing it quickly. Look, you can differentiate one over t, can't you? It's minus one over t squared. It's not, this isn't, this isn't, uh, you know, really complex stuff. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why it isn't in these big, thick applied mathematics books, because it's actually quite simple, but it's conceptually quite deep. And so they don't like that, like something with lots of algebra, lots of clever transforms and stuff. Okay, so um, here, it's just one over, you can see that it's just one over TD. Right, so this is one over TD, and then obviously you need to write out this bit. So Okay, so now let's write out our um, equation here underneath. So we have here, d s w by d v d, okay, and that's going to be for both terms. By we've got minus v d over t d, and then one over t d. So the t d's are going to cancel out. But let's let's just try not to do too many steps at once. Clear. Okay, so now you can see that the t d's go. Okay, and then I'm going to erase this again. This is standard. You can see this is standard stuff. Okay, so let's look at this. There are basically two solutions. One is, let's do, do it in black again. One is, d s w by d v d equals zero and that's called a constant state and that has s w is a constant now you might say well that's a trivial solution but yes originally in the reservoir we have our initial water saturation uniform everywhere that's the solution right um, if we would have, in fact, any saturation that was completely uniform and we just have that flowing, that is also a solution. So it's a trivial solution. There's nothing really interesting about it, but it is a solution. Okay. The other one is where this um, is zero, which means you know, put the minus signs around the other way. So it's minus VD plus this equals zero. So VD equals the FW. So this is called technically what's called a rarefaction. It's where dfds is a function of saturation and the velocity with which a saturation moves is equal to its derivative. And in fact, in general, if you were to look at any conservation equation, it doesn't matter how complex it is, right? This could be d something that's conserved, in this case, saturation by dt, d something the same something by the x and this function could be the most horrific non-linear term that was ever invented by mathemat mathematicians the solution would always be there's a velocity and the velocity is just what this term is so for any any case because we can generalize this conservation equation for lots of different other problems if we get it in this form then what is here is simply the velocity and it always is and you don't have to sort of plod through each step being worried about how well, do I differentiate this okay it's, it's always going to be the same so that looks like we're close to a solution so now what we need to do is we need to look at what this fractional flow looks like 
So what I'm going to do now is I don't need this. I don't need this. And I'm going to plot out what the fraction of flow looks like for different cases, right? So I'm going to keep the fractional flow here. Right. And then maybe attempt to draw a slightly better looking graph with a straight line. So, hey, this looks good, doesn't it? So now I've got a straight line, so it's a bit more professional. Okay, so what I'm going to plot up here is FW. And FW will have a maximum value, well, as we showed, not necessarily a maximum value of one. We've got a water saturation that goes SWI, and this is maximum one minus SWR, and obviously this is one. Okay, so let's first of all, Imagine we have horizontal flow, so we've got no gravity, so we don't need to worry about the gravity term. So this, this term we're going to ignore to begin with. Okay? So we want to try and understand this term. Sometimes what's this written um, in terms of the relative permeability? So I'm going to write it out here. This is KRW over mu W over KRW over mu W plus, K, plus KRO. And then what we do is we divide through, so it just becomes one over one plus, and it's just easier to visualize what's going on. There's no, you know, don't again get uh, over mystified by it. So I've divided through by KRW, and then we've got a ratio of viscosities here. So this is the fractional flow without gravity, and then there's the gravity term. So let's imagine that we have a sort of classic relative permeability. This is SWI, this again is one minus SOR. This is one, and it's a water flood relative permeability. So the water relative permeability does this, the oil relative permeability sort of does this. I mean, we will get to later, you know, really thinking about the physics of relative permeability, what it means in recovery. But now we just, you know, it's a curve. Okay. So What's it going to look like? So look, let's look at this equation. At low saturation, notice here, the water relative permeability is much lower than the oil relative permeability. So the fractional flow is basically pretty close to um, zero. Okay. When we get near the end point, we see the opposite. Okay. We're going to see maybe a re region where the oil relative permeability is much greater than the water relative permeability. So the, this is, sorry, the, the oil relative permeability is much lower than the water relative permeability. So the water fractional flow is close to one. So if we We'd expect to see something that sort of looks a bit like this and a bit sort of like this. But what about in between? Well, of course, there's a viscosity ratio here, but imagine the oil and water viscosities are similar. Just, you know, take an easy case. Then where these relative permeabilities cross is roughly speaking, right, where you've got equal flow of oil and water. So this is about the 0 0.5. So we've got a sort of 0 0.5, you know, maybe about. So what happens is your fractional flow sort of generically has this, um, what's called an S shape. It's a bit strange because it's not really an S, right? Because it's only, it's, it's single valued. Um, but what it does, is it has a point of inflection by which I mean, the starts at zero, the gradient goes up and up and up, reaches a maximum and then goes down and down. Okay? So the, um, so you have an inflection point with a second derivative essentially um, is zero, right? and then it changes sign on either side. Okay, so that's my fractional flow. Let's just think about what might happen under different circumstances. If we imagine we have a much heavier oil, if I increase my oil viscosity here, okay, this becomes large, the fractional flow stays close to one. So if we have instead a very high oil viscosity, so mu oil high, and we might define a mobility ratio, or viscosity ratio. Um, that's normally actually the, the other way around. Like this. So this is large. Right? So a large mobility ratio. So this is where we have a, a high um, oil viscosity. Right? We can define M either way 
we like, right? But this, this will be a large oil viscosity. Um, if on the other hand, if we have a large water viscosity, okay, then the water fractional flow stays low. We have something like this, and this will be a small M, and it'll be a large water viscosity. So this would be, say, a heavy oil in red, and um, what's shown in blue would be, say, pol uh, polymer flooding, where you put a polymer in the water phase to make it more viscous. Okay, so those, those are what um, generically the fractional flows look like. Now I'm going to do something interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put in gravity. Okay, and I'll do that in green. Okay. So imagine now we have this gravity term. Okay, so imagine to begin with, it's positive. We're actually injecting down here. Okay. So we're going to start here. Okay. And we're going to end up here. So to begin with, the water fractional flow is small, but the gravity term is obviously always positive. So if I use my black curve as my base case, my green curve is always going to lie above the black curve, but it's going to end up here. But the interesting thing is this term here, when lambda w is small or lambda oil is small, this term is small. It's when both of these relative cone values are significant that we can have a big change. And what this can lead to is something that looks rather curious. Okay. To begin with, the water mobility is small. Then this gravity term picks up, and the fractional flow can actually go above one. So we can have a region here. I'm going to be careful. So how can that be? How can we have a fractional flow above one? What it does is it represents relatively high water saturation. So you can imagine a case where the water okay, is flowing downhill at high saturation. There is some connected oil. If there's no connected oil, what you have is you have the water moving downhill. The small amounts of oil that we have are flowing uphill. Okay? We have counter current flow. The oil and water are flowing in opposite directions. And so FW plus FO must equal one. So F of the oil fractional flow is less than zero. It's negative. And it means I'm injecting water here. It's flowing downhill. So there's an overall movement down. But here, the oil is actually moving up. It's moving the opposite direction to the water. So it's perfectly physically reasonable. I, and often people, again, think there's something wrong or mysterious or rah, rah. But no, actually, it's fine. I mean, what do you expect? Water moves down, oil is buoyant moves in the opposite direction. Right? When we talked about the formation of an oil field and we talked about oil moving, moving up, right? it's, it's a buoyant fluid. Right? When it moves up, where does the water go? If there's a trap, it's moving down. Okay? So we, we sort of actually, we can say these things and we don't even think about it. And when it's an equation, we sort of get more um, worried, but actually it's perfectly straightforward. The other thing will be what happens if we're injecting uphill? Because in fact, it's more stable. You would normally inject water from the base right, from the aquifer upwards, right? So if we're moving uphill, actually, don't sort of overthink this. G, right, the flow direction is up, G is going down, this term is negative, right? It has to be, again, physics, you know, think about it physically. So in fact, the fractional flow of water is lower. So in this case, again, let's go get another color, then the orange curve is going to lie below the blue curve, and we get, the same thing, which is same endpoints, but here we can have FW is less than zero. Okay, so again, it's the same phenomenon. <laughs> We're going uphill, there's an overall flow upwards, but at low water saturation, what you find is, yeah, again, <laughs> what happens is the oil is moving up, but the water is moving down. So away from where the aquifer is, actually the you're, 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 you're doing something the oil wants to do. The oil wants to go higher, and the water is actually falling under gravity. Okay? So in both of these cases, we have what's known as countercurrent flow, where the oil and water are moving in different directions. And we're going to encounter that again when we talk about uh, inhibition. This is countercurrent. Okay. So I'm going to say much more about gravity. I mean, this is, this is what it is. You, you can see fractional flows that are both greater than one, less than one. And when you see this as an indication of a region where you have countercurrent flow, that is the oil and water moving in opposite directions, 
driven by gravity, and that makes perfect physical sense. But somewhere along the lines, um, we seem to have missed the solution, right? So let's write that down, right? The solution is the speed is just dfw. Well, let's have a look at what that would look like. And at this point, everything's getting a bit busy, isn't it, on this uh, graph? But we want to have fw, but I want to also want to plot um, what the derivative looks like. So what I'm going to do, maybe the easiest thing to do is to try and erase some of the um, things here, right, like this. Okay, so we're going to keep this, and then we, we don't have to talk about these other cases anymore. We've got rid of those. Okay, and then okay, good. So then um, we can take another color, and we can plot here f w prime or d f w by the s w. Okay, so imagine we take this graph, and what I'm going to show in red is the derivative. So to begin with, the derivative is zero. At this end point, the derivative is often zero. It turns out. It doesn't have to be zero. You could imagine a fractional flow curve that sort of comes in at a gradient. So let's let's give it a finite and obviously small value. As I've said already, the gradient increases, reaches a maximum around here, right, and then decreases. So you have something in terms of a gradient, right, where dfw by the sw, so it's not zero, it reaches a maximum. The second derivative is zero, and then it goes back. Okay, so that's, that's um, what the FDS looks like. And so the solution, right, if you think about what's the solution to the equation, would be then that the saturation, right, the saturation is going to be um, going to be a function, is just going to be um, VD is uh, uh, SW. So we have, I'm not explaining this very well because I'm going to draw a graph. Okay, so let's draw the graph. There's my saturation. It's a function of VD. So we're going to put, put VD on this axis, okay? And this is telling you the speed with which we're moving, okay? So you can imagine the way of thinking about it is, to begin with, everything is a, a low initial saturation. A large speed, this is XD over TD. Okay? So for any given time, a fixed time, a fixed instant, this is just showing me the distance. Okay, so I know it's plotted as x over t. It's a function of x over t. Then we're just uh, any saturation profile is just linearly stretching itself. But at any instant in time, so I say, look, I've been injecting for two years. Where is the saturation? A plot of s against vd is just looking at uh, s against distance, right? Just showing where where we've gone. Okay, and we know we're we're at one minus s of r here. Okay, so let's take this red curve. And plot it. So let's and then let's do it in red so that we can actually see this. So at one minus SOR, we have some possibly finite speed, it may be zero. Okay, and then as the saturation decreases, my velocity increases. So we're going along here, and then it reaches a maximum. So let's do that. Okay, then it reaches a maximum, and then it goes back down to zero. So you've got something like that. Okay, so it's basically this curve sort of shifted, it's twisted and shifted around. Um, but hang on. You want a solution that goes to here. Well, you can imagine you have a constant state there, that would be right. This is okay, but what if I get to here? And just a moment, here, I've got two saturations. And then here it's zero, that's not making sense. So this doesn't look like, I mean, you might think intuitively, you've got some saturation profile, okay, that goes from high to low saturation. Indeed, those are the boundary conditions. It says here, at low velocity, low distances, we need to be near one minus S of R. Out here, a long way from the injection well, again, think physically, right? A long way from the injection well, we're at the initial water saturation, or at least some low water saturation, and the water saturation goes from high to low. But this solution does that, it, it starts out high, but then it suddenly does this, so it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, okay? So, um, so there's something uh, has gone badly wrong here, okay? 
So I'm going to get rid of the whiteboard now. So I found it, we seem to be in a fix. So what was the fix? Turns out the fix was using a partial differential equation in the first place, right back when we derived a partial differential equation. We assumed that that was fine and in fact ever since the time of Isaac Newton, you know, the idea has been write down a partial differential equation and solve it and this is why these thick textbooks don't have this type of equation in because rather embarrassingly, um, partial differential equations don't quite work and the reason is because we're assuming that we have smooth changes in saturation, that there is in fact a definable derivative. It turns out in this case, there isn't, there is in fact uh, mathematically going to be a discontinuity in saturation that's called a shock. And that will be the subject of the next video. So I'll finish there.